That scripture that that fine young man just read for you is difficult. Why would Jesus get angry with a poor little fig tree? One of the things I like about that scripture is it presents Jesus as a real human being. But you combine his cursing of the fig tree with the proclamation that whatever you ask for in prayer, you heard me right, whatever you ask for in prayer will be yours. Lord, a new AV system. Forget that. That's not, I added that. Probably shouldn't have. I believe, though, we can make sense of this difficult passage if we examine the context. Let's take it back a bit. Jesus enters Jerusalem on what we know as the triumphal entry. He looks around in the Gospel of Mark at the temple. He goes to the temple, he looks around, and then he leaves. Based on later events, I don't think he was happy with what he saw. I don't. Next morning, on the way to the temple, he's hungry. And off in a distance, he sees a fig tree. And he begins to imagine, fantasize, if you will, the taste of a nice, fresh fig. After all, the tree's green, and he's not a horticulturalist. It looks to him like it ought to have figs. Are you with me? But it doesn't. It's like when you left something you really like in the refrigerator and you go to get it and it has. Yeah. Jesus gets there and he curses the fig tree and he immediately proceeds forth in the Gospel of Mark to kick tail in the temple. I don't think he was happy when he left the evening before. Now, what do you think's the common denominator between these two events? Put on your thinking cap. What's the common denominator? Well, I'll give you a hint. Trees and vines are symbols historically of Israel. The temple at the time of Jesus was the ultimate symbol of Judaism. The temple at the time of Jesus and the great entryway had a huge fruit vine across the front. Symbol of Israel. Bearing fruit. Bearing fruit was God's will for Judaism and Israel. It was to be a house of prayer for all nations. But the temple guards, the religious aristocracy that ran it, they had become the preeminent collaborators with Rome. It was a perversion of God's intent. It was a perversion of God's will. Like the fig tree across the gate of the temple, and like the fig tree that Jesus approached from a distance, they both looked good from a long way off, but they bore, they bore no fruit. You remember the story of the emperor who had no clothes? Remember that? And how everybody said, hey man, your new suit, it looks great. But one person had the courage to say to the emperor, hey, you're in your birthday suit, buddy, no matter what everybody else is telling you. One person had the courage to state the obvious. Jesus had the courage. And for that, they wanted him dead. I want to talk about fruit for a moment. How many of you grow fruit trees, vegetables, something in your yard, your property? Or you've done it before? I suspect most of us have. You know those vegetables? like that meat, they don't grow in cellophane packages at Albertsons. We have on our property, Marianne and I and my mom, we have medjool date trees that came in this week. Peach, fig, plums, nectarine, honeydews, and watermelon, and rattlesnakes. They like the varmints that those things draw. You gotta have a little sour with the sweet. But I've noticed this, 
being a liberal arts major, it took me a while, that if you don't water them enough, especially in the summer, the bloom, the blossoms fall off, and you don't get any fruit. And if you fertilize them at the wrong time, like when they're growing their fruit, if you put too much nitrogen in, you get all this green foliage. But that's all you get. No fruit. So you have to take care of them. Every human being, folks, hear me now, every human being, every institution will have its occasional dry spell with the resulting lack of fruit production. That's normal, it's cyclical, it's to be expected. The problem here associated with this scriptural narrative is more than a dry spell at the temple. They'd lost their saltiness, their authenticity. They were collaborators with Rome. They were moving to survive. They were going through the motions. Faith had little to do with it. Now I have a question for you. Would you consider the possibility that we've recently been through a dry spell as a congregation? Now, how long that went on depends on who you ask. I can tell you from my own personal observation, which is pretty important to me, when I arrived here a couple Octobers ago, whatever energy we possessed was being consumed by conflict. Now, don't get me wrong. The music was beautiful, and there was some nice stuff in the congregation. But the fruit, the excitement, the energy, is pretty thin. It feels different now. And maybe, just maybe, maybe and hopefully, a new day is dawning. Maybe you've had a dry season in your own life. Health, relationship, occupation, children. Lord knows they can create a dry spell or two. We're all going to experience the occasional dry spell, dry season. The issue is, because that's a part of life, the only issue is how do we handle that? And I will tell you, having been around a while, some choose to give up. Some choose to give up so much that they die. Some leave behind their commitments and wander. And some wander far enough to lose their faith. But some, a few, a select few, fight back. For the keepers of the temple, their dry season had become an occasion for an enduring lack of faith. They lost their faith. They had turned from God. Notice the tree, the vine. They had turned from God to Rome for their salvation. They wandered from the faith that they, in search of something easier, they lost because they gave up. Jesus, Jesus fought back for a restoration of authentic, prophetic Judaism. He fought that battle for them, and he's fighting that battle still for us. Now, here's something really interesting and I think revealing in this passage that's really the key to understanding it, I believe. After cleansing the temple, Jesus and his disciples are going back out of town and once again encounter the fig tree and it's in sad condition. When Peter points it out to Jesus, say, Jesus, see what you did the other day. Jesus turns that opportunity into a lesson. And his message to Peter is real simple. Have faith and you can move mountains. 
Now, I don't think he necessarily meant Peter was going to lift up Mount Everest with prayer and put it over in Europe. I don't think that's the point. The whole narrative is about a very simple proposition. Have faith. The whole entire Bible, from Genesis when God says, Abraham, move it, to the book of Revelation where God is saying, hang in there, I'm coming. The whole Bible is about the same simple proposition. Have faith, and you can move the mountains in your life. The writer of Mark wants us to understand that the fundamental problem with the temple stemmed from a lack of faith. And I want to ask you today, do you have faith? Do you believe that a new day can dawn in your own life? And do you believe that a new day is dawning or can dawn at Beatitudes Church. The book of James says, you have faith. I will show you my faith by my works. Your congregation, yeah, I know I've stepped out of the spotlight and you're no longer protected from me. Your congregation, this congregation, the future congregation, needs a new AV system. Some of you need to see the printed words of my sermon up there. And you can't hear what's said when the scripture's read sitting back there. I don't know how you're doing out here. We wanted to debut this system last Easter, but it wasn't happening. Now time's burning in the new church year. We need to get this done. Out of a $150,000 project, we only need $40,000 more. And we need to start putting this new system in now, this week. We need to meet the challenge pledges that have been made and instill the system. How many of you received a pledge card about this this week? If you didn't, you'll be getting it tomorrow or Tuesday. We need this sound system. We need the visual renovation for all the reasons that Pastor Andrea shared to respond in faith. The book of James says you have faith. Show me your faith by your works. I've written a check for $1,000 to be put on this sound system. I don't know any way to lead but by example. I also have my dollar to put in the offering plate. Because that needs to happen too. But I want to invite you to respond and respond generously, to respond faithfully this week. Because a new day is dawning here. You know, the dawning of a new day was not easy for the Israelites. The dawning of Christianity wasn't easy. It cost Jesus his life. But you know, when God called the Israelites out of bondage in Egypt, and they all fired up with Moses and headed out of town, and the next thing, you know what they found? They were stuck at the Red Sea. And the water was there, and the war chariots of the greatest superpower of that day was on their heels coming after them. And they were behind the idea of dying, being run over by chariots, or by being drowned in the sea. And you know what happened? You remember that narrative? God parted the Red Sea. But you know when God parted the Red Sea? And I don't care if you call it the Sea of Reeds. It didn't happen until they took their first step into the water. Martin Luther described faith as trust. I will tell you, faith is trustful action. Whatever you're facing in life, the only way to survive, and certainly the only way to thrive, 
is to take that step of faith and when we step out in faith it will be the dawning of a new day and we will move mountains. Amen.